Thank you for joining us today for cancer-associated venous thromboembolism, balancing risk and reward with modern edge coagulation. Today's presentation is brought to you by Creative uh, Educational Concepts and is supported by an independent educational grant from the Bristol Myo Scribb and Pfizer Alliance. My name is Marc Carrier. I'm one of the professor of medicine hematologists at the University of Ottawa in Canada. I do venous thrombosis and cancer for a living, and it's a great pleasure to be here today and have a discussion about the new updates on cancer-associated thrombosis. And now on to the learning objective for the presentation today. Over the next 40, 45 minutes or so, we'd like to do four things with you. The first one would be to identify disease treatment patients-related factors that will increase the underlying risk of having cancer-associated venous thromboembolism in patients with cancer, trying to assess who would be at bit higher risk, and if so, how do we provide education to prevent uh, venous thrombosis from happening? If venous thrombosis happens, what type of anticoagulation treatment strategies are available? How do we tailor anticoagulation accordingly uh, and incorporate the different management strategies and aligning it to the most current guidelines and evidence for patients with cancer? We'll develop strategies to coordinate care amongst members of the Cancer Associated Venous Thromboembolic Team. That will obviously include yourself, but also caregivers, other healthcare providers. And we do that in order to make sure patients understand the underlying disease, the potential consequences, and achieve optimal adherence to the uh, medication so that we have optimal outcomes for the anticoagulation management in that patient population. Now, you probably know that venous thromboembolic disease is not very common in the general population. We think about one or two per thousand, but as soon as a patient has a diagnosis of cancer and increase the odds by about fourfold, and if that particular patient is initiating chemotherapy, it's increasing the odds by 6.5 fold. So very common in the setting of cancer. And this was highlighted by a recent large database analysis from the Nordic countries where they identify 500,000 patients with a first diagnosis of cancer and 1.5 million without and compare them, follow them over two decades. And the first thing that they've shown is that the six month risk of VTE in patients with cancer is 12-fold higher compared to the general population. And if these particular patients are undergoing chemotherapy or immunotherapy, the risk is 23-fold higher. The second things they've shown is what you're seeing on this slide here, is that the 12-month cumulative risk of VT has been increasing over time. It went from 1% to 3%, so a three-fold increased risk over the past two decades, six-fold if these patients are undergoing chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So it's something that is very common in patients with cancer. It's not something that is going away. If anything, we're seeing more and more cancer-associated venous thrombosis. Now, why is that? Well, a lot of patients will be undergoing new types of chemotherapy, and some of them may be associated with a higher risk or more thrombogenic or a higher risk of having venous thrombosis. Patients with cancer are living longer, so more chance of having venous thrombosis complications. And then we're also doing more scans to follow patients over time. And we're finding incidental PEs, which have been shown to have a similar prognosis than uh, uh, symptomatic PEs and therefore need treatment. So all of these things are saying that, well, patients with cancer are at higher risk. And this risk seems to be increasing. That's why you and I, when we're on service and we're seeing patients in the intensive care setting, we're seeing a lot of cancer-associated thrombosis. Now, this is associated with some morbidity and mortality. We know recurrent VT is associated with a higher risk of uh, uh, recurrence despite anticoagulation. Patients with cancer are at higher risk of having bleeding complication on anticoagulant therapy, both of which are associated with uh, important morbidity, decreased quality of life, independent of the scale you're looking at. It's associated with increased mortality, but it's also associated with uh, an increase in the healthcare cost and, and uh, use of resources. And therefore, it may be important to identify patients that may be at a higher risk of having uh, these events and provide education so they can seek medical attention sooner so that we can uh, tailor anticoagulation in these patient population, avoid morbidity and mortality. So obviously, when we think about risk factors for VTE, a few things are coming to mind, some patients-related factors, cancer-related factors. We know different tumors 
persons with different risk of having venous thromboembolic complication, uh, biomarkers, and treatment-related factors are important. When we look at individual risk factors, uh, we know that none of them on their own is good enough to predict the risk of venous thrombosis in patients with cancer. We need to have combination or risk prediction models in order to do so. And there's a risk prediction model that has been used quite a bit over the past few years. Alok Karana and colleagues, Alok is now at the Cleveland Clinic. He derived and validated a score when he was in Rochester, New York. But it's a very simple uh, risk factors where you look at site of primary tumors uh, and some biomarkers. So pre-chemotherapy, pre white blood cell count, hemoglobin or hematocrit, and platelet count, as well as body mass index. And based on these factors, you get a certain amount of points and you can stratify patients according to their underlying risk of having venous thromboembolic event. Low risk, so less than 1.5 over the next six months. Intermediate risk, up to 10% or high risk all the way up to 20%. And based on these uh, risk over the next six months, then maybe providing some education about signs and symptoms of DVTs and PEs, and in some cases, having a discussion about primary trauma prophylaxis may be desirable. So let's have a look at, a, um, at the prognostic significance of this. So I'll have derived and validated uh, in the setting of a neutropenia database that he had. Uh, this score has been validated in multiple different studies across a number of different uh, populations. And a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, specifically looked at the performance of the Corona risk score. And then you can see that when you look at the three different uh, uh, stratification, low, intermediate, or high risk, you have a six-month increased risk that is increasing over time. And when you use a dichotomous type of risk factor, you still have uh, patients that uh, have a high risk have a 10% risk of having VT over the next six months, so an overall odds ratio close to two, which is uh, statistically significant, so important to keep in mind. Now, there's no doubt that the corona risk factor, like anything uh, in life, has some limitation. It was meant to be a score that is easy to use, that you can use for screening. You readily have all the information available in your clinic. But admittedly, all the different tumor types, different patients have different characteristics. So it'd be ideal to have something that is specific for tumor type, stage, and patient characteristics. So this score is meant to be uh, generalizable and used for screening. If you look at it in certain tumor type, for example, in lung cancer patient, it may not be, perform as well. But overall, when you use it in a chemotherapy unit or a cancer care unit, it seems to be working well in general. So if we look specifically at a patient case, a patient that you're seeing in clinic, a 57-year-old gentleman uh, recently diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer will be undergoing uh, chemotherapy. Uh, you can see the laboratory findings here show that he has leukocytosis, mild anemia, and thrombocytosis. Uh, he's also known to have hypertension, which is well controlled on the Zinopril. And you may ask yourself, because you've heard that pancreatic cancer is higher risk of having thromboembolic complication. What's the underlying risk of having venous thrombosis? Well, if you apply the corona risk factor, you would know that pancreatic cancer is at high risk, so you would get two points for that. You would get points for uh, uh, is thrombocytosis as well, and therefore based that he's at least at three points or more, he would be deemed to be at high risk. So his risk of having VT complication while he's undergoing chemotherapy, so in the next, next six months or so, is probably between 10 to 15 percent. Uh, and therefore, patients that are deemed to be at high risk may benefit from getting some form of education, uh, you know, discussing signs, symptoms of DVTs and PEs, because patients don't, don't necessarily know them. If we go to our chemotherapy unit right now and ask patients waiting for chemotherapy, do you know what febrile neutropenia is? Most of them would know that if they feel unwell, they need to take their temperature. If it's high, they need to seek medical attention, present themselves to their uh, the emergency room or call their primary care doctor. But if you ask the same patients where the signs symptoms of DVTs and PEs are, most of them don't know. And that's why we often see a lot of incidental findings. We see a lot of incidental PEs. So P CT scan done for underlying staging, reporting PEs, and then the radiologist is calling you. Often when you talk to the patient, patient knew, had symptoms, they felt short of breath, they had some chest pain, but they thought it was because of the underlying disease uh, 
or a side effect of chemotherapy, they did not know about the possibility of having a clot. So creating awareness is very important and to avoid morbidity, because if these patients know that they are at a high risk of having VTE, then they'll seek medical attention, decreasing the risk of recurrence, decreasing the risk of bleeding, and hopefully decreasing the risk of mortality, because thromboembolism, so arterial and venous event, is the second leading cause of death in patients with cancer equal with infection following the tumor, the underlying tumor per se. So it's important to keep that in mind. And then in, in the select patients, we'll go through uh, clinical practice guidelines down the road, but in selected patients providing some primary trauma prophylaxis with a prophylactic dose of a directal anticoagulant may be desirable. Two randomized controlled trials have shown a good risk-benefit ratio, so a relative risk reduction about 50%, but a slight increased risk of bleeding, so having a case-by-case -case discussion will be important. And this is referring to the guidelines that we uh, talked about. So if you look at the American Society of Clinical Oncology in 2020, you can say that in patients that are deemed to be at high risk of having venous thrombosis, so coronary risk score of two or three or more, you may offer thromboprophylaxis with a Pixaban or Rivaroxaban based on the studies that I was referring to, the Cassini and the AVERT trial. However, it's important to have a discussion with patients. Patients deemed to be at high risk of bleeding may not benefit. There's some costs associated to, with that. And these two trials have looked at primary trauma prophylaxis for six months. So beyond six months, there's still a little bit of unknown. And obviously, if your patients, if you're treating specifically multiple myeloma and they're receiving uh, image related uh, uh, therapy, especially in combination with dexamethasone, they may be at high risk of having venous thromboembolic complication. Other scales are available to help tailor that risk, but they may uh, require some form of trauma prophylaxis in the form of a direct anticoagulant or low equity heparin. But in some cases, we won't be able to uh, prevent clots from happening. Venous thrombosis, as I mentioned, is very common in the setting of cancer, and patients will show up with uh, lower limb proximal deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, and we'll need to tailor anticoagulation accordingly. And there's been quite an evolution of anticoagulant therapy over the past few decades, and especially over the last uh, five to eight years, it's been incredible. So we can go all the way back to infractionate heparin, vitamin K antagonist, low microwave heparin, and really the trials that have compared specifically in the setting of cancer, low microwave heparin to vitamin K antagonist or WARF in the early 2000s, that really framed practice recommendations of using low microwave heparin at the first line. We'll come back to that. But five or six randomized controlled trials have compared different low microwave heparin and osparin, delta parent, tins of parent to WARF and with good effect. And it's only in 2018 where we're starting to have data with the direct anticoagulant, apixaban, rivaroxaban, doxaban, compared to low microwave heparin for the management of cancer associated thrombosis. So we'll look at all the data together to try to figure out. Uh, if there's certain patients that would benefit from a low microwave heparin or a direct anticoagulant, and how do we tailor anticoagulation in that patient population? So, you know, as cl clinicians, when we make a decision about treatment, there's different consideration on, on what to think about. Obviously, we want to think about efficacy, safety, and then based on that, is there a patient population that would benefit or could be harmed with, by a certain type of anticoagulant? So we'll look at tumor type, We'll look at intracranial disease, so primary brain tumors, but also metastatic uh, brain lesions. We'll look at drug-to-drug -drug interaction. Is that important or not? We'll look at other comorbidities. Some patients may have gut resection, so is absorption an issue? Is hepatic function an issue? And then obviously we'll look at preference, and then we'll try to come up with a summary of the recommendation based on that. So let's look at efficacy and safety first. And then I mentioned that in the early 2000s, a number of randomized control trials that looked at different low microwave heparin, so that would be, for example, an oxaparin, maltaparin, uh, compared to warfarin, an INR between two and three. And as you may or may not know, when we look at efficacy in VT-related trials, we always look at recurrent venous thrombosis despite anticoagulation as being the efficacy outcome measure of choice. And that's what you're seeing on your left-hand side. So you can see from the systematic review meta-analysis that patients with cancer and venous thrombosis when they receive low microwave heparin, they have less chance of having recurrent VTE compared to warfarin, and therefore low microwave heparin is more effective. It will decrease the risk of recurrent VTE by about 50%. And when we look at outcomes of safety, we usually look at major bleeding, 
uh, which would be, for example, bleeding at a critical site, fatal event, intracranial bleeding, or a site like a joint, retroperitoneal, or a drop in the uh, hemoglobin or hematocrit by 20, or uh, two units of packed red blood cell transfusion. That would be the major bleeding definition from the ISTH, the International Society of Thrombosis Hemostasis. It has some limitations, but at least it's a standardized definition. And what you can see on your right-hand side when you look at the major bleeding based on that definition, there are no difference with low microid heparin and vitamin K antagonists. So these early trials in the early 2000s showed that low microid heparin was more effective as safe as vitamin K antagonists. So it was a slam dunk for clinical practice guidelines to recommend low microid heparin as first-line therapy for these patients when it was practical to do so and it not, cost was not an issue. Now, obviously, low microid heparin is an injection, often once or twice a day. It's expensive. So really, there was um, uh, some uh, eager to see if a directal anticoagulant, so rivaroxaban, dabigatran, uh, apixaban, or edoxaban, could be used in that setting. And obviously, we had a lot of data comparing the different directal anticoagulant to warfarin uh, for DVT and PE, not specifically in the setting of cancer. But it was only in 2018 for, that we had to wait for until we had the first trial comparing a DOAC, edoxaban, to low microid heparin, daltaparin in that setting. And that's the Ocusi VTE trial that you're seeing on your left hand side. So there was a large non inferiority open label randomized control trial comparing a DOAC to low microid heparin and following patients for 12 months. A month after in JCO, a select D trial, much more modest sample size compared to rivaroxaban at the P and DVT dosing. So remember, this is 15 milligrams PO BAD for 21 days, the 20 milligrams PO daily thereafter compared to delta parin, followed patients for six months with a primary outcome of recurrent VTE. And two years later, in 2021, we had Curvadu, the largest of the randomized controlled trial, comparing a pixaban to delta parin or low microid heparin. Remember, again, the apixaban is PE and DVT dosing, so that's 10 milligrams POBID for seven days and five milligrams POBID thereafter. And you look at recurrent VTE as the primary outcome measure. There is a smaller trial as well called Adam VTE that was uh, done uh, in the Mayo Clinic system that compared apixaban to uh, low microid heparin. So a lot of data that was uh, has been done over the past uh, uh, four or five years in order to uh, provide uh, more uh, insight on the safety and efficacy of DOACs in that setting. When we combine all this data together, so when we combine, we now have six randomized control trial comparing different DOAC to lomacoid heparin uh, for patients with cancer-associated thrombosis. You can see on the top when you look at efficacy that it looks like uh, DOACs are more effective uh, than low microid heparin because there's a relative risk reduction of about 30%, an absolute difference of about 3%, and people that receive a DOAC had less risk of recurrence. But when you look at the safety outcome and you look specifically at major bleeding at the bottom, although it was not statistically significant, some of the studies have shown that some of the DOACs may be associated with a slightly higher risk of bleeding complications. So it's important to keep that in mind when we're tailoring anticoagulation, we'll come back to that. When we look at the major bleeding within the different studies, and we look, remember, we talked about the major bleeding definitions, right? So when we look at the comparisons between those receiving DOACs and those receiving low microid heparin, and then you're trying to figure out what type of bleeding was more common in patients receiving a DOAC, there was no difference in fatal event or intracranial events. The big difference was uh, gastrointestinal type of bleeding specifically upper gastrointestinal type of bleeding. So from a major bleeding perspective, patients receiving a DOAC may be at slightly higher risk of upper gastrointestinal type of bleeding. And therefore, if you have concerns about that, then maybe the initiation of a DOAC may not be the right thing to do, but we'll come back to that when we look at clinical practice guidelines. And then some people also like to look at clinically relevant non-major bleeding. Why is that? Well. If you have a patient that has, for example, bladder cancer, uh, start on anticoagulation, uh, has immaturia, needs to go to the emergency room, has a cystoscopy, needs total bladder radiation, uh, needs one unit of packed red blood cell. I think you and I both agree that this is an important bleeding event, but as you notice, it doesn't really meet the criteria for major bleeding. 
So clinically relevant non-major bleeding is also important to assess because these are important to clinicians and patients requiring uh, you know, unscheduled appointment, using resources. And when you specifically look at clinically relevant non-major bleeding, patients receiving DOAC had a higher risk of bleeding. So an absolute difference of about 4% relative risk, uh, difference of about 65%. And when you really look down, you do a deep dive in clinically relevant non-major bleeding, a lot of these bleeding events are gastrointestinal type of bleeding and gentle urinary type of bleeding. And that's maybe why when you look at clinical practice guidelines using the American Society of Hematology or the American Society of Clinical Oncology or the NCCN, they're probably saying, well, you need to be mindful of using a DOAC if you have a non-resected GI or GU type of lesion, because you may increase the underlying risk of clinically relevant non-major bleeding and may be increasing the risk of major bleeding in certain uh, situations. Now, is there a type of tumor that you need to be mindful of? Well, this is a post-hoc analysis of the Okusai VTE cancer. So remember, this is the New England Journal paper in 2018 that compared uh, edoxaban to lomacoid heparin. And they showed an increased risk of major bleeding in that particular trial. So the investigators said, well, can we try to identify who was at higher risk? Remember, it's still a small number of events, but when they stratified patients according if they had a gastrointestinal type of tumor, or not, you can see on your left-hand side that patient that had a gastrointestinal type of tumor and received edoxaban, they had a fourfold higher risk of having bleeding complication, most of which were gastrointestinal type of bleeding compared to those receiving naltoparin, and certainly no difference in the non-GI cancer. And that's part of the rationale, while some of the clinical practice guidelines say, well, you need to be mindful of initiation of a direct anticoagulant in patients that have a gastrointestinal type of, of tumor. Now, are there other, other patient characteristics that may increase your um, likelihood of picking one agent to the other, like using lomacoid heparin versus a directal anticoagulant, for example? What are there other types of features? Is intracranial disease one of them? Uh, this is something we see all the time as clinician and present an important challenge of anticoagulation. Um, so the first question is, if you have intracranial disease, if you have brain mat, so if you have primary brain tumor, can you initiate anticoagulation? This is a relatively recent systematic review and meta-analysis that was published in Blood Advances on one of the Journal of the American Society of Hematology. As you can see on the top, they tried to stratify based if it was metastatic disease or primary brain tumor, and then they tried to look at or do comparisons between patients that um, receive anticoagulation or not. Now, admittedly, you know, this is low quality data, mostly observational, not randomized, different indication, often warfarin and lomacoid heparin, some DOAC. But you can see that when sometimes this is all we have to make clinical decision, we look at on the top of metastatic disease, there's no increase in the risk of uh, intracranial bleeding for patients with metastatic disease receiving anticoagulation. So generally, if you have a patient with METS, new indication for anticoagulation, I don't lose sleep about initiative anticoagulation. Now, admittedly, some patients may have highly vascular tumors, uh, renal cell carcinoma, uh, melanoma, for example. They may ha still have a slightly higher risk, but if there's no signs of uh, bleeding on the most recent CT, uh, if there's concern, you can always repeat a CT yet, but usually there's no Con concerns of uh, increasing the risk of intracranial hemorrhage with anticoagulation. But if your patient has a primary brain tumor, now these you know, gliomas, for example, are quite heterogeneous in nature. Some people will need surgery or, uh, or radiation or may require uh, chemotherapy so, uh, or cyber knife. So in this setting, when you look at the uh, risk ratio, you can see there's an increased risk, about fourfold increased risk of of intracranial hemorrhage for those receiving anticoagulation. But you know, it, if you have a new indication, you probably have to have a case-by-case -case discussion in assessing what the risk-benefit ratio. Now, is the presence of metastatic disease or primary brain tumor making you pick a DOAC versus a low microwave heparin or vice versa? Well, it doesn't look like there's much difference. And this is a, a nice little observational study published in the Journal of Thrombosis the, the Journal of the International Society of Thrombosis Stasis, 
It's the group by Jess Wicker when he was in Boston, who's now at MSK. But you can see that they looked at their own uh, uh, data uh, uh, in Boston, stratified them if their patient had primary brain tumor on your left hand side, brain mets on the right, and then looked if they received a DOAC, which was mostly rivaroxaban or lomacoid heparin, mostly in oxaparin, followed them over time. Now, admittedly, you know, this is observational study. There's a lot of limitation. It's hypothesis generating only, but provides some reassurance because when you look at the two curves, there's certainly no increase in the risk of bleeding for patients that have received a DOAC compared to a low macroid heparin, independent on the type of patient population. And that was shown again in this study uh, that was a collaboration between uh, folks in Israel and, and the Netherlands. And they followed patients. This is only brain meds, though, but followed patients over time. And you can see that there is no increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage in patients receiving a DOAC compared to a low macroid heparin. In, in fact, it seemed to be the opposite. Now, again, observational studies, lots of reasons why clinicians may have picked the low macroid heparin or DOAC. It's not randomized hypothesis generating, but still re is reassuring. And there's a, a more recent analysis that showed similar things. So it's not, I don't use the presence of metastatic disease or uh, primary brain tumor as uh, a, one of the characteristics that will make me pick an agent over the other. However, keep in mind that low microwave heparin has a much smaller half-life or shorter half-life compared to a direct lens coagulant. Uh, so some people feel more comfortable using it. If there's intracranial hemorrhage complications, some people may feel comfortable, more comfortable uh, managing a bleed uh, with a, a, an enoxaparin or vice versa with a DOAC. So it really depends on the case by case and the resource available within your center. Now, is our drug-to-drug -drug interaction something that you should also consider? And that's important because when we use the noxaparin or low microwave heparin mostly, there are no real drug-to-drug -drug interaction. Sure, there's some interaction with anti-inflammatory medication, antiplatelet, but not really a drug-to-drug -drug uh, interaction and pharmacokinetic perspective too much. Um, so no doubt that the direct lens coagulants have less drug-to-drug -drug interaction compared to warfarin, but they still have important drug-to-drug -drug interaction that are important to consider. They're dependent uh, <clears throat> on the CYP3A4 metabolism uh, uh, and on the glycoprotein P for absorption. So if you have strong inhibitors uh, of the CYP3A4 or the glycoprotein P, it may lead to a higher level of your uh, DOACs and that may increase the risk of bleeding. But if you have strong inducers, both pathways, then that may lead to lower levels and therefore higher risk of having recurrence. Um, so, and then the drug-to-drug -drug interactions are slightly different between the different DOACs. So Pixaban and Rivarox, I mean, have a very similar type of drug-to-drug -drug interaction class. And then uh, Edoxaban and Dibigatran have uh, similar interactions because they're more dependent on the glycoprotein P uh, compared to Pixaban and Rivarox. Now, this is all theoretical in nature, and you may be wondering, well, Mark, is there any uh, formal, uh, clinical, uh, important interaction that we should be aware of? And we're not actually too sure, and the data is a little bit on both sides, so I'm prevent, pr providing you with examples that shows that maybe we should be mindful with a certain type of uh, medication and some reassuring data as well. So the TAC-DOAC was a prospective uh, cohort study from the uh, International Society of Thrombosis Hemostasis looking at patients on the DOAC and targeted anti-cancer therapy. They showed high bleeding risk complication, especially in patients receiving BTK inhibitors, so the CLL type of medication. Another cohort of smaller group showed both increased risk with anoxaparin and a direct anticoagulant when VEGF, TKI were used. And then other Postdoc analysis, for example, the Caravaggio trial, remember, comparing a Pixaban to Lomacoid to heparin did not show any difference for patients in the risk of recurrence or bleeding for patients receiving anti-cancer treatment, specifically chemotherapy, com compared to those that were not. Now, having said that, drug-to-drug -drug interactions are very specific, so your pharmacist, uh, you know that you need to look at a certain indication per se. Uh, and, you know, if you look outside of the cancer-associated thrombosis arena, this is an example showing that it may have a, a clinically important uh, difference. So this is a large database looking at patients that are on the DOAC for various indication 
mostly atrial fibrillation, but they looked at patients that receive a prescription for clarithromycin, for which is an important drug to drug interaction, should not be used concurrently. And those that receive a, 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 a prescription for azithromycin, for which there are no uh, drug to drug interaction with a different DOAX. And you can see here uh, in the table, and as a conclusion, that patients that had a drug to drug interaction had a higher risk of having uh, a, a uh, hospital admission for a uh, bleeding complication within 30 days of the interaction. So it, it was small, but still present. So if you have a drug to drug interaction, then maybe use an alternative agent. We have different DOACs are available. We have parenteral uh, anticoagulation is also available. So while you have a certain drug to drug interaction for and maybe for a short medium term interaction, maybe changing agent may be desirable at that particular time. And then there's other things where uh, it was shown not to be uh, important. So for example, if you've been uh, treating cancer associated for thrombosis for a while and you look at narrative reviews in 2018, and uh, you know, tamoxifen was one of the things that was listed to avoid DOAX with uh, because it has a potential drug-to-drug -drug interaction through the metabolism pathway we just talked about. And then when we specifically looked at large databases again, Sufei Wang and colleagues have shown that there really is no difference between patients taking tamoxifen and the DOAC compared to those without any drug-to-drug -drug interaction, like an aromatase inhibitor, for example. Again, showing that you really look to look, you we really need to look at all the different combinations until we've proven that there is no concern, then maybe using an alternative is the right thing to do. Now, patients with cancer will also have all sorts of other comorbidities, right? They may have resection, they may have inflammation in their gastrointestinal tract, and that may lead to decreased absorption. So it's important to remember that the different DOACs are absorbed throughout the gastrointestinal tract, that they're absorbed through different, different places, and that may lead to lower level if there's absorption concern, then maybe you should use an alternative. So edoxaban is mostly absorbed in the proximal small intestine, rivaroxaban in the stomach, and apixaban is absorbed throughout the GI tract, uh, and then uh, particularly at the distal small bowel and the ascending colon. So if you have a patient that has a certain resection uh, and then you're concerned about absorption, uh, so ruin Y, for example, then maybe using edoxaban, rivaroxaban is not the best, then you should be using apixaban in that particular setting and vice versa. So it's important to be mindful. Now, are these related to clinically important difference and in, in, in the levels that would lead to clinical outcomes? We don't know, but we have alternative and, and therefore why not use an alternative if there's a concern. And similarly for uh, liver disease, we mentioned that uh, the DOACs are dependent on metabolism through the CYP3A4, uh, uh, and therefore if there's liver dysfunction, uh, you may affect clearance. And you can see that edoxaban is less dependent on hepatic clearance compared to rivaroxaban and apixaban. And therefore, you need to be mindful of using these, uh, these agents if there's severe renal dysfunction. In the, in the clinical trials, uh, patients were excluded if they had a child uh, pew C, for example. Child's pew B was okay with edoxaban and apixaban. And child pew A, uh, then all the, all the different DOACs uh, were uh, used in that setting. So having a look at uh, functional liver dysfunction, maybe also important because we have different uh, options than using an alternative agent if there's concern may be desirable. And obviously patient's perspective is important. And when patients are seeing you or I with their clots, uh, the first thing that they have on their mind is, Mark, do whatever, but don't interfere with my anti-cancer treatment. Don't postpone my uh, surgery if you can. Don't change my chemotherapy. So that's the first thing that we need to account for. After that, you know, attributes from patients, sure, we want something that is effective and safe. And then third is the route of administration. And the reason why I'm, I'm putting these in that particular order um, is because patients selected that particular order so that you can sometimes go from an oral agent to parenteral agent and vice versa, depending on what's ongoing in the underlying patient's journey of cancer.
if they are going for surgery, then maybe you need to switch them to parenteral agent for a while or if there's a drug interactions before we challenge them to an oral agent and vice versa. And the patients will accept that. They'll accept to, uh, that you tailor anticoagulation. You just need to, under, they need to understand why. So if you sit down with them and, and explain why you're doing this to make sure that there's no interference with the cancer treatment, safe and effective, and then we may use oral versus parental for a while before we challenging, they'll be very willing to do so. Now, this work was done by Simon Noble and colleagues from the United Kingdom. Uh, Professor Noble is based in Cardiff. He's a palliative care doctor. And you, if you look at the reference, you look at it's 2015. So this was when we would use lomacrine heparin anyway. The alternative was warfarin. Uh, and it was before we had data on the DOAC. So maybe this, this patient perspective is outdated a little bit. But uh, Professor Noble and colleagues repeated uh, this uh, mixed study uh, doing interviews of patients uh, more recently alongside of the SELECT-D that compared rivaroxaban to lomicoid heparin and found the exact same uh, results and same conclusion. So independent if you have DOAC, warfarin, or lomicoid heparin, First thing on patient's time is no minus, no interference with cancer patients. Then it's efficacy and safety, and root administration comes last. So if we put all that together, if you look at the American Society of Hematology, the 2021 guidelines, uh, what they're recommending is in the setting of an acute clot, then the ASH guidelines suggest a direct anticoagulant apixaban and rivaroxaban, or lomicoid heparin for the initial treatment, so the first few days. Why is edoxaban not there? Well, remember, if you want to use edoxaban, there's a five-day leading of lomicoid heparin in, the, in all, the, all the clinical trials. So that's why apixaban and rivaroxaban specifically listed for the acute phase, as well as lomicoid heparin. And for the short term, the initial three to six months, then they would suggest a DOAC apixaban, edoxaban, rivaroxaban over lomacoid heparin based on the data we said. But if you looked at the fine prints, they say if your patient's high risk of bleeding, then be mindful that maybe using a lomacoid heparin like amoxaparin, for example, may be desirable in that patient situation. So <clears throat> what, what the NCCN guideline is saying, it, more or less the same thing, apixaban, edoxaban, rivaroxaban are preferred for patients without gastric and Yes, with decimal type of lesions, because remember, DOAC seems to increase the risk of bleeding complication, certainly clinically rather than non-major bleeding, possibly major bleeding, at least some of the agents. And it seems to be these bleeding complications seems to be gastrointestinal, mostly uh, upper GI type of bleeding. So that's why the NCCN is quite specific. So lomacoid heparin is preferred for these patients. Uh, and uh, treatment of, to prevent blood clots, so primary prevention, is not recommended in low-risk patients, but they suggest to consider primary probe prophylaxis for patients that are deemed to be at high risk based on their current risk score, as we saw. And if you want to have a bit more information, then you can use the Q, QI code. Now, what do I usually do in my, in my clinic? So I have a patient with proximal lower limb DVT or PE or proximal upper extremity DVT. Uh, the first thing I think about is, is this patient's high risk of bleeding? They had prior history of bleeding. Is there unresected high risk GI lesions? Are they thrombocytopenic? And I looked at renal and liver impairment. And if they're on the I asked myself why they're on it. And if there's no indication to be on top of anticoagulation, I usually discontinue it. But if these patients are high risk of bleeding, maybe challenging to a low microwave heparin may be desirable at least early on before transitioning to uh, a direct anticoagulant. Type of tumor is important. We mentioned unresected intraluminal GI and GU cancers. So if these patients are have these types of tumors, then maybe I would re-challenge or I would challenge them to anticoagulation with a parenteral agent first, make sure they're not bleeding, and then transition them to a direct anticoagulant. Same thing with drug-to-drug -drug interaction. But for a large majority of patients that are not filling these different criteria, a direct anticoagulant is, is preferred. And obviously, there's going to be some Practice variation based on your setting, where you practice. Uh, preference will be important once a day, twice a day. Drug cost, body mass index, uh, absorption, these types of things also need to be included in consideration. 
uh, for uh, the right agent for a particular patient. So in order to uh, get the patient engaged, first understand, and then get engaged and understand why blood thinners are important and to prevent morbidity mortality associated with it, I think it's important to have the patient really centered into the discussion. So how the patient is receiving education, do they feel like they have control, do they understand the underlying disease, the risk factors, the importance of taking the medication or not, uh, and the review of uh, patient and providing patient for, uh, uh, patient related information material may be important so that they feel that they can own the disease and be engaged in the underlying treatment, be compliant overall. Because when you look at uh, patients and you look at uh, blood clots education in the setting of oncology clinics, we're not doing very, very well. So this is uh, a, a thousand patient survey. 50% of patients had more than three healthcare visits before being currently diagnosed with a blood clot. 55% uh, felt their diagnosis was explained to their satisfaction, so there's lots of room for improvement. And 60% responded receiving print or electronic information on blood clots. So again, certainly lots of uh, room for improvement, and we'll show you some patient information material that you may want to use. 97% um, re remembered being treated with anticoagulation, but only 48% recall being told any specific information including the risks and benefits, what to watch for, for example, bleeding signs, symptoms, when to seek medical attention. So I think patients' resources are really important. Uh, you can have a look here to the educational material you've received, but there's different uh, national organization, the National Blood Clot Alliance, for example, uh, uh, the North American Thrombosis Forum also, so SMART goals uh, following this presentation. So SMART goals need to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, timely. So put information into action, consider the following goals, then set a time frame that fits with your own work environment at a reasonable improvement target that aligns with the patient population. So <clears throat> one of the things to consider might be increasing the percent of patients with cancer were assessed for VTE using a, a, a VTE-related risk score or uh, a bleeding related risk score and providing them with risk benefit ratio. Um, ensure that each patients are compliant with prescribed VT prophylaxis or treatment uh, uh, as documented by patient reported behaviors and medication that you can have in your electronic medical record and increasing the percent of patients who participate in therapy decision using shared decision making as documented by increased delivery of patient education to their health care. And uh, to receive CNEC credits for today's program, complete the post-test uh, post and evaluation, be able to download and print your certificate. Okay, so the first question in the Q&A is, um, how long should pa patients receive DOAC after VTE? So assuming the question is related to proximal lower limb DVT, uh, or pulmonary embolism, usually we do a six-month course of anticoagulation. After six months, then if the patient is in remission, then you can safely discontinue anticoagulation because after the initial six months, the clot is cured. The rationale to pursue beyond six months is for signaling prevention. So if the clot is gone and the risk factor is no longer present, we usually can stop anticoagulation. If they're still undergoing uh, treatment, or there's underlying cancer, like pa patients with metastatic disease, then we tend to continue uh, anticoagulation beyond six months for secondary prevention. Now, can you reduce the dose of DOAC? Let's say you're using a Pixaban, the patient's been on that Pixaban 5 milligrams POBID, can you reduce it to, to 2.5 BID? We don't know just yet. There's a trial called APICAT that will be done in September 2024 that has compared over 1,500 patients with cancer-associated thrombosis and compared 5 to 0.5 BID for single prevention. So that will provide uh, data to support dose reduction after six months. There's a small trial that was presented but not yet published last summer in 2023 called the EVE trial comparing 2.5 to 5. And the trial was small, so maybe not powered to detecting the difference. But when you look at the point estimate, they were very similar. And therefore, one could say that maybe there's no difference. So 
I guess I would do a case by case basis. If your patients have really high risk of recurrence, low risk of bleeding, I'd probably continue on with the five BID. If on the opposite, patient may be at high risk of bleeding, lowish risk of recurrence, and decreasing the dose may be desirable. Hopefully, that uh, is helpful. The second question is how would you switch a patient between low micro heparin and low micro heparin to DOAC? Uh, what are the safety issues? So assuming that the patients have uh, creatinine clearance that are above what is recommended, let's say that we use over 30 so we can use low micro heparin and direct or anticoagulant, then I would just switch a tablet for the needle or vice versa at the time that is next scheduled. So for example, if your patient is on um, a Pixaban 5 milligrams POBID and needs to go on low micro heparin, I would say, well, tomorrow morning, instead of taking your Pixaban dose, then take your low micro heparin uh, instead of the needle. If it's dosing that is once a day of low micro heparin or twice a day, then I would continue that. Although there's difference, differences in the half-life between the product, we mentioned in oxaparin, six hours, the WAC gets between 10 to 14, depending on the agent. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no concerns about replacing one by the other, assuming good reading function. So there's no, uh, there's no safety issues uh, related to that. Uh, are there clinical scenarios in which you may consider lomacrit heparin over a DOAC or vice versa? It's an, another important question. So I think, as I mentioned, uh, I would tend to consider lomacrit heparin first line for patients with a gastrointestinal or gentle urinary unresected tumors. DOAX makes your mucous membrane very prone to bleed. So I tend to challenge them to a lomacrit heparin instead of a DOAC. If a patient is thrombocytopenic, I, I feel like low micro heparin, we can use intermediate dosing. We can tailor dosing a little bit more compared to DOAC. Not that we can't do it with DOAC, but we have a bit more clinical experience. So in patients with renal dysfunction, I tend to, uh, sorry, with thrombocytopenia, I tend to use uh, low micro heparin. Um, and in the perioperative setting, I tend to use low micro heparin. Otherwise, I I'm, 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 uh, use DOAC quite a bit. Uh, uh, unless there's a particular concern as we uh, previously highlighted. Um, what are the cancer therapy classes that, that have been at increased risk of DTE? So, you know, the platins type of chemotherapies have been shown to uh, be, uh, be at higher risk. It's, associated, it's included and in, we didn't look at all the different risk predicting models, but it's including in some, it's included in some of the models. So, platinum-based chemotherapy. Um, uh, uh, there's, uh, yeah, I was thinking about multiple myeloma, so the IMIDS would be another type of, chemo, so immunomodulatory type of chemotherapy. Checkpoint inhibitors uh, may be associated too. Remember that some of these, um, some of these treatments are relatively recent, so we're still learning what's the underlying risk of VTE. And sometimes we use them more for second or third line. So is it really a, a, a treatment effect or is it like a staging type of effect? Uh, what is known though, is that the current risk score seems to be good at stratifying patients and dependent of the type of uh, chemotherapy they're getting. So maybe include the type of therapy has a higher risk of having VTE, but really risk stratification to begin with are patient related factors including biomarkers like the CBC parameters we talked about may be a bit more important in that setting. But an excellent question again. And then how do you manage a patient who experienced VTE if they have uh, cardiomobility like hypertension, CHF or COPD? So I tend to, uh, well, I would say that the first thing is obviously we're wondering if the patient requires hospitalization for observation. If the patient requires op uh, hospitalization, I tend to use a parenteral agent, and then I would switch them to a direct anticoagulant upon discharge. Um, if from a cardiopulmonary perspective, uh, unless they have uh, some massive or massive PE for which they may require additional intervention, uh, I don't tend to look at other comorbidities too much. So cardiopulmonary like hypertension, CHF, and COPD. 
I tend to make sure that if they are on other agents, for example, antiplatelet, which may increase the underlying risk of bleeding, I tend to make sure that if they don't have a firm indication for it, or if anticoagulation could be used for primary or secondary prevention of arterial event in that setting, then I tend to discontinue antiplatelet to mitigate the higher risk of bleeding. But other than that, I don't have any uh, special uh, uh, special uh, things that I look for uh, specifically to make a decision about which antiquity to use. Hopefully that's answering your question. So I thank you very, very much um, for attending the presentation. If you have any particular questions that we didn't have the time to address, we didn't have the time to chance to put on the chat, uh, you feel free to send me an email. I'll be happy to entertain that. And uh, hopefully it was helpful. And I wish you a very nice day. Thank you.